Hey everybody, uh, my name is Jeff Murren. Thanks for joining me in our continuing discussion of uh, the Odyssey, uh, Homer's Odyssey, specifically the Robert Fagel's translation. And in this uh, installment, we are going to focus on chapter or book 12, The Cattle of the Sun. All right, so just to recall from the last video, um, Odysseus had gone, had, you know, he'd left Circe's island and had gone to uh, down into the underworld to the to the um, uh, the kingdom of the dead, as it's called in this uh, translation, he went to the kingdom of the dead, and there he uh, talked to Tiresias, the blind uh, prophet. He saw his mom; didn't even know his mom had died. His mom died of uh, broken heart, essentially. Um, he met Agamemnon and heard Agamemnon's story about how when he came home, he was. Uh, killed by his wife plotting against him with her new lover. Um, we heard from uh, Achilles and how Achilles would ra rather actually be alive here and be a nobody on earth than to rule over the breathless dead, as it were, in the case where he's, you know, what we see as being glorious isn't necessarily as glorious as the humble life that he could be living amongst the rest of us. Um, we saw that the, um, Ajax still holding a grudge against him uh, for the for Achilles' armor. Um, and so, essentially, you know, what happens is Odysseus gets the information he needs to know, okay, how is this going to play out? All right, and we get some more information after he leaves and returns to Circe's island. Um, about how it's all going to play out for him, and then we see some of it actually ends up following exactly the way Cersei tells him. All right, so it, it comes true. Like, hmm, what's the John Lennon song? Instant karma. Okay, he finds out this is what's going to happen, and turns right around, and it just happens exactly the way he uh, hears about it. All right, so let's go ahead and begin our discussion or our reading and whatnot, beginning in uh, Book Twelve, page two seventy one. The second line of that second section right there. I dispatched some men to Circe's Hall to bring the dead Elpenor's body. Remember Elpenor, he's the one who was drunk on the roof, passed out, and then rolled off and died. And then Odysseus saw him in the underworld and said, hey, I need to be buried properly. And so Odysseus is going to see to it that his man gets what he deserves. We cut logs in haste, and out on the island's sharpest jutting headland held his funeral rites in sorrow, streaming tears. Once we'd burned the, dead man, uh, burned the dead man and the dead man's armor, heaping his grave mound, hauling a stone that coped it well. We planted his balanced oar aloft to crown his tomb, and so his oar actually served as a tombstone there for him. So then he sees Circe, and Circe says, and I find what she says here fairly interesting. She says, this is about line 23, You who ventured down to the house of death alive, doomed to die twice over. Others die just once. So the fact that they went to the underworld, she's almost considering that their first death, and then they will suffer an actual death when their time comes, when fate decides that their time is here. And I find that interesting. So is this then, could we make the argument that the his return to the realm of the living, you know, back on earth is sort of a resurrection of sorts. It's almost like Cersei's implying that, but, uh, you know, don't know if we need that for anything, but maybe that's a way to look at it perhaps. Okay. I find it, I find it, I find it interesting anyway. It says, come take some food and drink some wine, rest here the live long day. Then tomorrow at daybreak, you must sail. All right, so she's giving him some pointers when he sets sail. One of the things is the sirens. You've probably heard of the sirens. These uh, women who sing some beautiful song on rocks and uh, on a, you know, an island, a rocky island, and their song is so alluring that uh, people who sail by and hear it, they cannot resist. And so they will veer their ships towards that song because they cannot resist the sound of the of the voices of the sirens and it leads them to their death on the rocky crags that surround the island all right um so she discusses this about line 41 says your descent to the dead is over true but listen closely to what i tell you now 
and God himself will bring it back in mind. First, you will raise the uh, you will raise the island of the sirens, those creatures who spell bind any man alive, whoever comes their way, whoever draws too close, off guard, and catches the siren's voice in the air. No sailing home for him, no wife rising to meet him, no happy children beaming up at their father's face. The high, thrilling song of the sirens will transfix him, lolling there in their meadow, round them heaps of corpses, rotting away rags of skin shriveled on their bones. So it's like these sirens are singing where they are and there are just dead bodies of sailors strewn all about who could not resist their song. It says, race straight past that coast, soften some beeswax and stop your shipmates ears so no one can hear, none of the crew. But if you are bent on hearing, then have them tie you hand and foot in the swift ship, erect at the mast, uh, erect at the mast block, lashed by ropes to the mast, so you can hear the siren song to your heart's content. But if you plead, commanding your men to set you free, then they must lash you faster, rope on rope. So the idea is, you know, what you'll need to do is stop up your crewman's ears. You can stop up your ears too, and then no one hears that, and you can just sail right on past. But it's such a beautiful song. If you want to hear it, if you want to hear it then you stop everybody else's ears and have them tie you up so that you are rendered essentially useless. And even if you beg, please, 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 let's go that way, that direction toward that song, they are commanded not to listen to you when you do it. That way you can hear their beautiful music, but you're not gonna suffer the consequences of it, all right? Um, and she warns of cliffs. She even mentions uh, a character, Jason, um, and the ship Argo down towards the end of that, you know, that full section that's on page 273. And that's a re reference to Jason and the Argonauts uh, um, from other mythology that we're not really paying attention to here. But it's interesting to see the intertextuality of that one mentioned in this one just offhand. Then we hear of these two things, Scylla and Charybdis. Scylla is some sort of sea monster, or maybe not sea monster, but cliff-dwelling monster around the sea that has several heads and arms and things that will attack people. And on the other side is Charybdis, which is essentially a, whirl, a, a whirlpool that's been personified, okay, that can suck people down and spews water up and sucks people down and things like that. So let's, let's take a look at this. It's about line 92 on page 274. It says, no rugged young archer could hit that yawning cave with winged arrows shot from off the decks. Scylla lurks inside it, the yelping horror, yelping no louder than any suckling puck, but she's a grisly monster. I assure you, no one could look on her with any joy, not even a god who meets her face to face. She has 12 legs, all writhing, dangling down, and six long swaying necks, a hideous head on each. Each head barred with a triple row of fangs, thick set, packed tight, and armed to the hilt with black death. Hold up in the cavern's bowels from her waist down, she shoots out her head out of the terrifying pit, angling right from her nest, wildly sweeping the reefs for dolphins, dogfish, or any bigger quarry she can drag from the thousands Amphrodite spawns in the gro groaning seas. No mariners yet can boast they've raced their ship past Scylla's lair without some mortal blow, meaning that no one has made it without some death happening on their ship, okay? Or she causing death or whatever, okay? She, um, anyway. Um, you know, I wonder what, how that's given a, a you know, it's gendered in this. It's interesting. Um, but anyway, they seem to know. Uh, with each of her six heads, she snatches up a man from the dark, proud craft and whisks him off. The other crag is lower, you will see, Odysseus, though both lie side by side, an arrow shot apart. Atop it, a great fig tree rises, shaggy with leaves. Beneath it, awesome Charybdis gulps the dark water down. Three times a day, she vomits it up. Three times she gulps it down, that terror. Don't be there when the whirlpool swallows down. Not even the earthquake god could save you from disaster. Like this is even more powerful than what Poseidon 
could even handle. So you are out of luck if you are having to deal with this. Like if you get sucked in, you are doomed, all right? No, hug Scylla's crag. Sail on past her top speed, better by far to lose six men and keep your ship than lose your entire crew. So it's one of these, uh, you know, kind of like the, 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 the trolley dilemma, okay? Are you gonna go straight at this and perhaps risk losing everything? Or are you gonna go, you know, a different way and most likely, given history, lose something, but maybe not all of it, all right? Um, he kind of has this idea, I want to fight her, and they're like, and she's like, don't be stupid, man. Don't be a hero. Just get yourself through it, all right? Um, <clears throat> she says on page 275, uh, after that second break there, about line, let's say 137, says, you will make the island of Thrinacia where herds of the sun gods cattle grazed and fat sheep and seven herds of oxen, as many sheep flocks rich and woolly, 50 head in each. Skipping down to, let's say, 148. Leave the beasts unharmed. Your mind set on home, and you all may still reach Ithaca, bent with hardship. True, but harm them, those animals, harm those animals in any way. And I can see it now. Your ship destroyed, your men destroyed as well, and even if you escape, you will come home late, all shipmates lost, and come home a broken man. All right, so hmm, given that this has taken him 20 years, you know, how do you think that played out? All right, let's take a look. Uh, he gets with his men, they sail on, and he repeats just about everything that we've just looked at to uh, the men, so the men are all on the same page, all right? Uh, he ends up plugging the ears with the beeswax, and they tie him up the way she suggested so that he can hear those siren songs. And we hear the siren song on page 277, line 200. It says, Come closer, famous Odysseus, Achaeus' pride and joy. Moor your ship on our coast so you can hear our song. Never has any sailor passed our shores in his black craft until he has heard the honeyed voices pouring from our lips. And once he hears to his heart's content, sail on, a wiser man. We know all the pains that the Greeks and Trojans once endured on the spreading plain of Troy when the gods willed it so, all that comes to pass on the fertile earth. We know it all. So they said their ravishing voices out across the air, and the heart inside me throbbed to listen longer. I signaled the crew with frowns to set me free. They flung themselves at the oars and rowed on harder. Pyramides and Eurylochus springing up at once to bind me faster with rope on chafing rope. But once we'd left the sirens fading in our wake, once we could hear their song no more, their urgent call, my steadfast crew was quick to remove the wax I'd used to seal their ears, ears and loosen the bonds that lashed me. So they made it. Okay, They made it because the crew could not hear, and they made it because the crew would not release him or he would have driven them all to destruction, all right? Uh, he mentions, uh, you know, that he still wants to fight when he comes up to, against Scylla because it cramps his style otherwise. Let's look at maybe line 245 on page 278. But now I clear my mind of Circe's orders, cramping my style, urging me not to arm at all. I donned my heroic armor, seized long spears in both my hands, and marched out to the half deck forward, ho uh, hoping from there to catch the first glimpse of Scylla, ghoul of the cliffs, swooping to kill my men. Okay, like I'm, I'm going to maybe not take that advice. I took the other advice of, of, of you know, blocking everyone's ears but I'm not so quick to take the advice about not fighting because I am a soldier. I'm a warrior. It's in my blood. All right. Uh, skipping a couple lines says, Now wailing in fear, we rode up on the straits, Scylla to starboard, dreaded Charybdis off to port. So we've got these two, you know, off in, in, in the two directions. Her horrible whirlpool gulping the sea surged down, down, but when she spewed it up like a cauldron over a raging fire, all her churning depths would seethe and heave, exploding spray, showering down to splatter the peaks of both crags at once. But when she swallowed the sea surge down her gaping maw, the whole abyss lay bare and the rocks around her roared, terrible, deafening. Bedrock showed the, uh, showed the deep Bo showed down deep boil black with sand. 
an ashen terror gripped the men. But now, fearing death, all eyes fixed on Charybdis, now Scylla snatched six men from our hollow ship. So his ship is just like everyone. It did not make it through without some mortality. Six men snatched up by Scylla right out of the ship. The toughest, strongest hands I had, had. and glancing uh, backward over the decks, searching for my crew, I could see their hands and feet already hoisted, flailing higher and higher over my head. Look, wailing down at me, comrades, riven in agony, shrieking out my name for one last time. Just as an angler, this is a nice uh, epic simile here, just as an angler poised on a jutting rock flings his treacherous bait in the offshore swell, whips his long rod, hooks, uh, hook sheathed in an ox horn lure, and whisks up little fish. He flips on the beach break, writhing, gasping out their lives. So now they writhed, gasping as Scylla swung them up her cliff, and there at her cavern's mouth she bolted them down raw, screaming out, flinging their arms toward me, lost in that mortal struggle. Of all the pitiful things I've had to witness, suffering, searching out the pathways of the sea, this wrenched my heart the most. All right, so he's just, it was, it was a terrible sight. And the sounds of them getting devoured was awful, and he had to endure it. And he said it was just one of the worst parts of any of the other things he's seen so far. Line two. 89, I was struck once more by the words of the blind Theban prophet Tiresias and Aeon Circe too. Time and again they told me to shun the island of the sun, the joy of man. So I warned my shipmates gravely, sick at heart, listen to me, my comrades, brothers in hardship. Let me tell you the dire prophecies of Tiresias and, and Aeon Circe too. Time and again they told me to shun the island of the sun, the joy of man. Here they warned, the worst disaster awaits us. Row straight past these shores. Race our black ship on. So I said, and the warnings broke their hearts. But Eurylochus waded in at once with mutiny on his mind. Okay, that's important right there. You're a hard man, Odysseus. You're fighting spirits stronger than ours. Your stamina never fails. You must be made of iron head to foot. Look. Your crew's half dead with labor. They just endured all that. Scylla attacking them, the whirlpool of Charybdis going down. Okay, so these guys are exhausted, all right? Look, your crew's half dead with labor, starved for sleep, and you forbid us to set foot on land, this island here, washed by the waves, where we might catch a decent meal again? Drained as we are, night falling fast. You'd have us desert this haven and blunder off into the mistbound seas. All right, skipping down to 319. So Eurylochus urged and shipmates cheered. Then I knew some power was brewing trouble for us. So I let fly with an anxious plea. Eurylochus, I'm one against all. The upper hand is yours, but swear me a binding oath. All here that if we come if we come on a herd of cattle or fine flock of sheep, not one among us, blind in his reckless ways, will slaughter an ox or ram. Just eat in peace, content with the food immortal Circe gave us. All right. So we have supplies, and if we stop here, just promise me, promise me that if you see those animals, don't bother them. Just take the supplies that Circe gave us, and that'll be that. All right. And Odysseus goes off. And prays on the island. So they, they go to the island and they moor their ships and he approaches the island and he goes to the island and he prays. Line 362 on, line, on page 281 says, I rinse my hand in sheltered spot and windbreak, but soon as I had prayed to all the gods who rule Olympus, down on my eyes they poured a sweet sound sleep. All right, so he's, he's fast asleep. But as Eurylochus opened up his fatal plans to friends, Listen to me, my comrades, brothers in hardship. All ways of dying are hateful to us poor mortals. True. But to die of hunger, starve to death, that's the worst of all. So up with you now. Let's drive off, pick off Helios' sleek herds. Slaughter them to the gods who rule the skies up there. If we ever make it home to Ithaca, native ground, erect at once a glorious temple to the sun god, line the walls with hordes of dazzling gifts. But if the sun 
inf inflamed for his longhorn cattle means to wreck our ship and other gods pitch in, I'd rather die at sea with one deep gulf, gulp of death than die by inches on this desolate island here. Okay, so what he's saying is, let's do this. Let's eat. Let's devour everything. And when we get back, if that's our fate, then we can build a temple to him, essentially to thank him for allowing us to eat his cattle. But if that's not what's going to work out and we're going to die anyway, I would rather die out on sea, like take it like a man and die, then just wither away and starve to death here. To me, that's a better death. All right. And so he convinces them to do this. And when Odysseus wakes up, he goes down and he sees them. And it's interesting what he says, because it's almost like he doesn't want to take the responsibility for being worn out and you fall asleep. He blames the gods. And when you believe that the gods control everything, then you can blame the gods for whatever you want. And it's interesting because one can blame the gods when things go bad, and then one can just praise the gods for everything that goes good, and then one uh, decides when to take responsibility and when not to take responsibility for his own actions. All right? But let's look about line 393. It says, That moment... Soothing slumber fell from my eyes, and down I went to our ship's water's edge. But on my way, nearing the long beak craft, the smoky savor of roast came floating up around me. I groaned in anguish. He knows what's coming. He knows it. Crying out to the deathless gods, Father Zeus, the rest of you blissful gods who never die, with your, with your fatal sleep, you lulled me into disaster. Left on their own, look what a monstrous thing my crew concocted. All right? So... I, think, I find this interesting. The next thing I want to read to you, it's on page 283, about line 421. All right. Um, see if this, this structure sounds similar to you. As soon as I reached our ship at the water's edge, I took the men to task, upbraiding each in turn. But, you know, but how things, but how to set things right. We couldn't find a way. The cattle were dead already. The gods soon showed us all some fatal signs. The hides began to crawl. The meat, both raw and roasted, bellowed out on the spits, and we heard a noise like the moan of lowing oxen. He can actually hear these cattle as if they're coming back to life or, or, or moaning and groaning while they're on the spits being cooked. But listen to this. This right here. This is what I'm getting at. Six more, yet six more days, my eager companions feasted on the cattle of the sun, the pick of the herds that they'd driven off. But then, when Crony and Zeus brought on the seventh day, the wind in its ceaseless raging stopped at last, and stepping the mast at once, hoisting the white sail, we boarded the ship and launched her, made for open sea. So they ate, continued to eat of the cattle for six more days. But it's that structure there. Six days this happened. But on the seventh day, we were open. So it's like, you know, the creation story from the Old Testament. Six days, uh, he worked to create the world, but on the seventh day, he rested. So six days they did this, but on the seventh day, then we could go off and do our own thing. Okay, I found that to be But once we'd left that island in our wake, no land at all in sight, nothing but sea and sky, then Zeus, the son of Cronus, mounted a thunderhead above our hollow ship, and the deep went black beneath it. Nor did the craft scud on much longer. All of a sudden, killer squalls attacked us, screaming out of the west. Top of 284. A murderous blast, shearing the two four stays off. So the mast toppled backwards. It's running tackle spilling into the bilge. The mast itself went crashing into the stern. It struck the helmsman's head and crushed his skull to pulp. And down from his deck, the man flipped like a diver. His hearty life spirit left his bones behind. The man died from this uh, wind breaking the mast and it breaking his skull. Then, in the same breath, Zeus hit the craft with a lightning bolt and thunder. Round she spun, reeling under the impact, filled with reeking brimstone, shipmates pitching out of her, bobbing around like seahawks swept along by the white caps past the trim black hull, and the god cut short their journey home forever. 
that God cut short their journey home forever. They died, never made it. They're done. Page four, I mean, not page, but line 463. All night long, I was rushed back. And then at the break of day, I reached the crag of Scylla and Dire Cribdis's vortex, right when the dreadful whirlpool gulped the sea, the salt sea down. But heaving myself aloft to clutch at a fig tree's height, like a bat, I clung to its trunk for dear life. Not a chance for a good, firm foothold there. No clambering up at either. The roots too far to reach. The bow too high overhead. Huge swaying branches that, over, that overshadowed Charybdis. But I held on, dead set, waiting for her to vomit my mast and keel back up again. Oh, how I ached for both. And back they came, late, but at last. At just the hour, a judge at court who settled the countless suits of brash young uh, claimants raise, rises. Uh, the day's work done and turns home for supper. That's when the timbers reared back up from Charybdis. I let go, plunge with my hands and feet flailing, crashing into the waves beside those great beams and scrambled aboard them fast. I rode hard with my hands right through the straits and the uh, father of men and gods did not let Scylla see me. Else I'd have died on the spot, no escape from death. I drifted on nine days. On the tenth, at night, the gods cast me on a Gigi at Calypso's island. All right. So his ship comes down, and when it spews back up, he drops down from the tree and sets back on the ship to drift on what's left of it. And he ends up on a Gigi's island, which is where we first found him. So it's almost like, okay, if you recall how the story goes... We find him on uh, Calypso's island. And then he goes and meets up with Nausicaa and King Alcinous and Queen Arete and tells the story to them. And he goes back to when he left Troy and tells us all the story. And now we are caught up to where we first met him. So now the story can just go on linear in real time. And so we're going to follow him now as uh, they help to sail him home. All right, so after this, uh, we're gonna talk about book 13. So in the meantime, I want you to read book 13. I want you to annotate book 13. I want you to have your own original thoughts on book 13 and then meet me back here and I will give you my thoughts on book 13. All right, so until then, and as always, I will say to you, happy reading.